But this is basically like a, a, we, we had a panel um, at ACOG, the, the uh, OBGYN Professional Society. Um, and this is more or less like, you know, uh, like w w what I w what I what I shared with that uh, with them. And um, these were actually the learning objectives from that. But I want to, you know, as um, I want to just, you know, I mentioned how like substances um, have a particular resonance with women in the historical record and probably no substance more than cannabis. Um, this is Queen Victoria here in the middle, who's probably the most well-known um, medical um, cannabis uh, person. Um, she was prescribed cannabis by her royal physician for menstrual pains. On the left-hand side, this is from an um, archaeological um, dig in contemporary Israel, where they found the remains of what was probably a 16-year-old who died during labor, and they were able to recover, you know, from actually like the body, what they think was the body itself like extracts of hemp and other cannabinoids um, that they think might have been utilized um, in uh, the attempt to um, correct what was like, you know, a fatal um, obstructed um, labor. And on the right hand side, this is from the turn of the century, there were mostly the era of so called patent medicines, um, so called because none of them were patented, um, but um, in which like, you know, this, um, these were like ovarian and cannabis compounds, clearly, you know, uh, something that was directed uh, towards women as consumers containing um, um, both uh, ovarian substances and um, cannabis, amongst some other things. So this is like, so cannabis has actually been part, not just of, it, you know, of sort of pre-modern health, but actually pre-modern women's health. Um, and I think of this current um, historical moment as really like this era of sort of cannabis extremism. You know, on the one hand, we really, we have NIDA and Nora Volkov, who's the head of NIDA, who's published like more and more recently about, you know, dangers, risks of cannabis in pregnancy than she has almost on any other topic, certainly in the commentary form. And the bottom is the prior Surgeon General sort of um, advisory. Um, and these are concerns about in utero exposure. We'll talk more about this and developmental outcomes. So that's one side. And on the other side, we have products like here, this quote unquote weed tampon, um, which are THC containing vaginal suppositories for the relief of menstrual symptoms. And cannabis.net has had multiple articles about women's health. Um, and it should not be a surprise that cannabis can, in, according to them, really improve women's health. And this sort of binary thinking is is I think problematic. And we see it sort of play out, um, you know, in this interface between um, medical science and, and especially like sort of social media response. And this is a um, NIDA funded trial on the left at the University of Washington, looking at primarily medical cannabis and developmental outcomes in newborns. Um, and then on the right hand side, this was a, was a tweet back to them, you know, as you offer to pay expected mothers to use cannabis Will you be informing them of the research findings at JAMA Psych, which was uh, showing that prenatal maternal cannabis use is linked to psychotic symptoms in kids, asking for a friend from Tuskegee. And if you guys don't know, like Tuskegee is like one of the many horrible stains on American medical history where black men were infected with syphilis in the South and not told that they had syphilis and followed in order to understand the natural history of the disease, a, 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 a research that was, you know, unethical. Um, and, um, and, and, and horrible. And there's a lot, lot you know, basically experiment, human experimentation. So linking this study to that is highly charged, racially charged. And, um, and this to me sort of illustrates like, you know, this, this false dichotomy, right? You know, what that cannabis is harmful versus, you know, it's healthy um, on the side of cannabis pro pro prohibition, you know, versus really sort of cannabis promotion. And I don't think this is the right way to organize the conversation. I think we actually have to differentiate people who use cannabis, people who use it, you know, for medical reasons only, and people who have a cannabis use disorder. And um, we tried to do this. This is through the National Survey of Drug Use and Health data. And you can, you know, comparing pregnant, non-pregnant people. And you can see, like, as you know, like people who are not pregnant are more likely to report past 30 day use, but not people who say that their use is medical only. And that, you know, we, this has to be unpacked. 
Um, when you look at the proportion of people with recent use who meet criteria for a use disorder, people who are pregnant are more likely to have a use disorder than people who aren't. However, they are not more likely to receive any treatment. So I would say that the bulk of the current research is actually on exposure and consequence, but not to how on how to support, you know, birthing people in quitting or in cutting back or investigating the potential, you know, benefits of cannabinoids, or at least, you know, comparing the outcomes, these developmental outcomes, not medical cannabis to nothing, but medical cannabis to that, those things that we prescribe. And I will say that um, Kaiser Northern California is doing a study that is looking at developmental outcomes, comparing people who are using cannabis for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy and people who are taking prescribed medications for nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. And that is the proper way to kind of set up the research. Now in thinking about like, what is what are really the outcomes and what do we know? This is like the National Academies of Medicine in 2017 did a, did a whole sort of survey of the state of the evidence, and they endorsed a statistical linkage between smoking cannabis and low birth weight. But they said the evidence regarding all of the other outcomes is unclear. In other words, there's not evidence of harm and there's not evidence of safety and there's not evidence of benefit. And the literature is really limited by one, like we don't know, we don't ask the same sort of standardized questions about frequency and duration of use. We don't have a cannabis dose like we do for cigarettes or for alcohol because it's a more or less illegal substance. And we need to know what that dose is, the frequency, duration in order to actually adequately measure outcomes. And the other problem is, is that much of the literature is confounded from other substances, in particular, alcohol and tobacco. So there's a concern, you know, the concern is that will, you know, liberalization of cannabis policies increase cannabis use in general, but in particular in pregnancy. And that's a legitimate question to ask. On the left hand side here, these are data from move, uh, monitoring the future. This has been a annual survey of um, grade school and high school kids. It's been going back since like the late uh, 70s. <clears throat> and you can see there's a relationship, an inverse relationship between whether or not people perceive something as risky and how likely the population is to use it. When the risk is higher, use is lower. When the risk is lower, uh, you know, the perceived risk is lower, the use is higher. But that's like high school kids. Um, what about pregnant people? And we, we looked at this, we did a survey <clears throat> of um, people in a primary, you know, in a general um, like OBGYN, you know, prenatal care clinic. And we looked at, you know, um, we asked a whole bunch of different questions, but one question we asked was, would you smoke more if it was legal and you were pregnant? And, you know, almost everybody, 90% of people said no. But if amongst people who said you know, they'd ever used cannabis, you know, 17% said yes. But when you drilled down further, it was entirely amongst the people who continued to use cannabis during pregnancy anyway i.e. people who likely, because we didn't do this in this study, had a cannabis use disorder, not everybody else. So I think the concern might be overstated in terms of the risk of legalization and what we're gonna see in pregnancy. We actually have two natural experiments, both one from Colorado and one from the state of um, Washington pre and post legalization, looking at um, um, various different uh, birth outcomes. And in both of them, there's been like not, there has not been an increase in NICU admissions, nor a decrease in birth weight, you know, in up at, at the population health level following um, legalization. This is, this is reassuring data from the population health level. Now, none of these really address the issue of um, development. <clears throat> and the concern, this is the concern for all substances to which people develop addictions because the organ that's primarily affected by addiction is the brain. So what about the fetal brain? And what does exposure in utero mean in terms of developmental outcomes? And these are really important questions, but I think we don't really put them in the proper understanding of cognitive development. There's actually nothing special happens to the brain at birth. 
going from in utero to um, outside in the delivery room, that does not, nothing, nothing changes actually in the brain. There's a linear development starting as a fetus through childhood and into young adulthood. And the moment, the real change that happens in terms of cognitive development is around the age of 26. So that, and you think about that whole, you know, childhood and adolescence and young adulthood, the time of exposure of that is so much greater than the time of exposure in utero. <clears throat> and cannabinoids exert their potential effect on development, not just in utero, but in childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood as well. So I think when we try to you know, have this discussion about development and outcomes and drug exposure, we have to think about that it, developmental outcomes are about a lot more than in utero exposure. And we need to understand the baseline of what brain development is like um, and think about interventions across that spectrum. The final sort of point I wanted to make resonates with like the discussion we had about urine drug testing. And that we actually misinterpret, I think, on the whole, you know, cannabinoid metabolites. This is a typical urine drug test cup that you'd use in an outpatient facility. The technology is the same for any sort of anything that's not a confirmatory test that Dr. Pierce um, defined really nicely. And you'll see on this cup or in the printout you get, it'll say THC as in delta-9 THC, as in the most common and the, one of the psychoactive components of the plant. But it's actually not THC that's being measured. It's carboxy-THC, as you can see here on the metabolic you know, pathway which is not psychoactive. It's highly lipophilic. It remains in the biological matrix for you know, up to 100 days following the last cannabis use. And I will add to this that we do not know how long it remains inside of a pregnant person. That's never been studied. I've submitted a grant that didn't even get scored to, to try and um, 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 get, get numbers for that. So the presence, so it's not as if, as is sometimes misinterpreted, in particular around breastfeeding recommendations, that this infant is being exposed to THC, delta-9 THC, the psychoactive ingredient. They're not. That actually leaves the biological compartment usually, well, there's two studies, one within hours, one maybe a day to two days. Um, but not the inactive metabolite sticks around for a really long time. So I think this misunderstanding, this is a specific example of how urine drug test, you know, not understanding what the test is actually testing for, um, like it negatively impacts the care that we're trying to provide to people. So I've mentioned this in the last talk, but I think we, you know, we are all socialized um, in sort of racialized and punitive drug policies, and therefore we interpret things through that lens. And I think we have to unlearn some of that in order to holistically really take care of people. And, um, and I, you know, I get, try and get away from sort of false dichotomies from this sort of extremist um, discourse around cannabis right now and shift the focus instead, you know, to support birthing peoples, their families, their communities. You have my contact information. I'm going to stop sharing um, so we can talk about this. So thank you. Thank you so much again, Dr. Turplin. And I'll just say overall, I think what you just stated about the THC is very interesting and speaks to what our previous topic was about drug testing. Um, and do we need to test for THC in, you know, when you think about what you said, um, are when we are gonna order one, we need to be very deliberate about it. So. Thank you. Yeah, and know what the results are. So like, um, I mean, also point of care drug tests, like um, they don't test for the drug, they test for metabolites of the drug. And some metabolites stick around for a really long time, like cannabis um, or cannabinoids, um, and some like leave within hours. Um, and, and, and that's a problem from a clinical perspective, you know? If, if, if you have a positive drug tested delivery that's capturing a use that happened three months ago, which could totally be happened, what does that mean? <laughs> and how is that, how is that a gold standard? 
um, compared to, you know, somebody telling you like when the last time they, you know, used cannabis was. Dr. Turplin, back to our kind of discussion about diagnosing a use disorder, would you be able to discuss um, how to distinguish cannabis use from a cannabis use disorder? Since I bet yeah. that is a pretty common question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, I think sometimes it's actually really helpful to ask people, do you think you, you know, have an addiction to this? Like, it, and, and again, like, I, people who use drugs are, I, I would say, more knowledgeable about addiction than the average person, but, but not, 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 not categorically experts in diagnostic criteria. Um, so I think that can be helpful, like kind of state of mind. Um, but, you know, the, 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 it's really like, you know, continuing to use something you feel is harming yourself and others and being unable to stop doing it. That would be like the, the, the you know, the core, um, core of, of addiction. But walking through the DSM, it would be like, you know, cravings you know, um, um, compulsive use? Have you tried to quit back and been unable to? Has your use interfered with um, obligations at home or work or school? Um, you know, have you, have you used it in a risky context? That, that can be a little, like, there's, there's a grayness around these diagnostic, you know, categories within, within the DSM. You know, that can certainly be like, you know, drinking and driving a vehicle, drinking, uh, you know, at, at, or using a drug at, in, in work or, you know, or something like that. That could be risky. Um, it could be like using, you know, using cannabis when you're caring for, um, you know, two children at home. That could be considered risky. I mean, there's, there's, there's like interpretation um, and even judgment sometimes like in, 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 in the uh, assessment of, of, of the diagnostic criteria. Um, and, um, and then, you know, there's tolerance and dependence, uh, which are actually the least important parts of the, of, of the diagnosis. So tolerance means you need to increase the dose or the frequency in order to maintain the effect. And dependence means when you stop, you have withdrawal symptoms. <clears throat> Those, um, if present, um, can be helpful um, in a conversation, but in and of themselves, um, those are, you know, biological, physiological principles. Um, but addiction, when we think about it, it, the primary symptoms are behaviors. You know, really being unable to stop doing something that you, 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 you feel like is harming yourself or others. And then next question after that, um, what treatments are available for a <laughs> cannabis use disorder? Yeah, um, well, there's no medication um, uh, for a treatment of cannabis use disorder. Um, and uh, the primary treatments that have been studied really, really, uh, are behavioral, um, um, cognitive behavioral therapy and et cetera. Uh, there is, I just submitted a grant to look at um, something called Reset, which is a behavioral health app, um, a digital a prescription digital um, technology that's um, FDA authorized. Um, the only um, prescription uh, or the only digital um, um, therapeutic that is um, FDA authorized to look at um, utilizing that in pregnancy. Um, my, you know, I, I think uh, this is a place where people struggle, you know, um, and, and your, your example of, you know, well, okay, you've asked me to assess people and now I've identified somebody who uses now what? That now what is like, so much bigger for cannabis than it is for opioids or alcohol or even to some extent stimulants. Um, there are, um, so, <clears throat> you know, I think that's where, you know, what do I do personally? We do, um, you know, there, if you have access to CBT, great. Um, or contingency management, great. But you just, uh, you just, you know, do, put, put on your behavioral health hat and do, um, you know, a motivational interviewing grounded, um, you know, um, encounters and, uh, and really let people like, you know, to some extent, like, you know, like set their goals. It's sort of like working with people um, uh, uh, who are using, op who have chronic pain, you know, there's a lot of similarities between chronic pain management and, and some of this sort of behavioral addiction management, you know, for chronic pain, like the question is like, what, what are you not doing now that you would like to do, you know? I'd like to be able to, you know, like lift up my grandkids. Great. You know, 
who can figure out the pieces to, to get you there, you know, physical therapy, you know, whatever, relaxation, some topical, like whatever, you know, um, and the same thing to some extent can be, you can think about it with it. What is, you know, what, a, uh, especially for people who may or may, may be on the border of a, of a diagnosis, you know, um, you know, like, but, you know, want to quit, maybe they don't want to quit, but they want to cut back. So what, like, you know, you know, what does recovery look like to you? Like, where would you, if you had a magic wand, if you're one of those questions, you know, what would you, what would you, you know, change about like, you know, what, what you know, your, your current, you know, existence. And then, you know, take that as, as, as the goal, have the patient tell you what their goal is and help them work there and know that that goal will change. And then I hope maybe this is something that resonates too with other providers that are on here. But one thing that's come up um, a lot in our clinic is, and not even just surrounding substance use, but even for example, like with diabetes, like someone who, um, you know, isn't checking their blood sugars, you know, is not following their diabetes diet, you know, how, like, how much do you kind of like hammer at home every single time you see them for a prenatal visit that they need to be doing these things and, um, you know, how like intense do you get about it at every visit, knowing that we see, you know, people during pregnancy every, you know, one to two weeks sometimes for a lot of their pregnancy, um, kind of similar question, um, related to cannabis use, like, is this something that like every prenatal visit you're addressing in a, you know, kind of deep way, or how do you work that into your prenatal visits? Um, and obviously I'm sure that that shifts over time as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting comparison because like, you know, sugar is a teratogen, <laughs> like, and, and cannabis is not. Um, uh, uh, and and, and we, we handle those like quite differently. I mean, I think it depends on the person. And, and I think that's where a lot of the sort of like open-ended questions can be really helpful in clinical care, you know. It, 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 you know, is it, you know, what, what, what would you like to talk about today? You know, um, you know, how is it going, you know, quitting back cannabis, um, you know, uh, uh, um, like some of those, some of those, like, you know, like, um, kinds of, kinds of things I think can be, can be like, uh, like really helpful. The other thing is to kind of think about, um, um, you know, uh, like to, 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 to one, like reflect back positive stuff. You know, um, it sounds like, you know, um, having a healthy birth is really important to you, you know, but you're concerned about your continued use of cannabis and just, you know, stop and let the person like try and resolve, you know, um, that ambivalence. And then the final thing would be really thinking about, like, I think digging deeper into this medical piece, you know, like we dismiss it. And we even sometimes say, like, people say it's medical because, because just because they're saying that. <laughs> we don't really believe it's medical. But I wonder, you know, like, why is somebody choosing, to, you know, to use, or why is somebody, yeah, choosing to use cannabis for the treatment of, like, what they think, you know, pregnancy related symptoms or whatever? Is it not like, you know, a reflection of, you know, our failures of, of like traditional medicine, skepticism, legitimate skepticism of, of you know, pharmaceuticals. Um, uh, you know, what, um, you know, like, what do you, how do you think it's working for you? Is it working for you? Um, what else have you tried? You know, sometimes people say like they can list off more, you know, anti-emetics than I even could pull out of my head. Um, and, you know, so I think the goal is always like, you know, like, you know, you know, the patient, the person, you know, um, keeping her healthy and part of health is keeping, you know, her engaged. Um, and, um, and, and so, yeah, so hammering every time would be probably like the opposite of motivational. That'd be like demotivational interviewing. <laughs> we have another question in the chat box saying that from 2007 to 2020, Oklahoma has seen a tenfold increase in meth uh, overdose deaths. What are the evidence-based approaches for stimulant use? Yeah, so that general literature I cited in the beginning that showed that treated use disorder, you know, equals better birth outcomes. If you even like dial back the clock to some of the work in the 70s, what they meant by treated use disorder was just prenatal care. Even if you have people 
who use amphetamines, who engage in prenatal care, like their birth outcomes are actually like more similar to a general population than people um, d- uh, who, who don't um, uh, engage in any care. So engagement in care in and of itself is helpful. For stimulants, there um, there is some evidence. There's there's there are med- there's many medications that have been studied for the treatment of stimulant use disorder. A little bit more have been studied for cocaine than for amphetamines, but probably in the brain it's pretty close to the same thing. So I would not imagine marked difference. Many of them, or some of them, show modest effects. None are FDA approved, but I I have utilized um, um, topiramate being one of them, um, like you know for people who um, um, have stimulant use disorder. Um, buprenorphine for people of co-use, you know, are co-occurring use disorders, opioid and um, um, stimulant. Um, there is some evidence that buprenorphine, you know, um, uh, reduces, uh, you know, <laughs> um, stimulant use amongst people. Um, whether it, it, it wouldn't really be used as a standalone, and that could be less about the medication and more about the engagement and care. And then the final thing is, you know, like this would be a place for specialty addiction programming, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and contingency management uh, being amongst, you know, the more established uh, behavioral modalities for the treatment of stimulant use disorder. And there is another question that says, did I miss it or does THC hurt? the fetus or baby? Uh, it's a great question because like we, we want, sometimes we want a binary answer and I can't give it to you. Like, um, and that's uncomfortable. Um, but, um, you know, unlike, you know, alcohol where we have a very, the evidence is very clear on, on what the consequences of, of in utero um, alcohol exposure are. For nicotine, the consequences are, are, are quite clear, you know, certainly in terms of birth outcomes. For cannabis, I would say the association that the, the strongest association is low birth weight, and none of the other um, like there other the other birth outcomes the data are mixed, completely mixed, and then developmental outcomes quality of the data starts to like kind of fall off, and um and 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 we get into like sort of measurement issues, um and the measurement being the act attributing the outcome, let's say high school's test performance to the in utero environment and neglecting all of the all of the years of schooling and, and life and family between birth and when they took that high school test. So overwhelmingly, um, like um, I would not say that, you know, cannabis hurts the fetus. Um, it, it's associated uh, with low birth weight and um, the evidence for any other association is um, at best mixed, um, and um, and um, uh, yeah, at best mixed. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Turplin. I have one, another one um, that uh, buprenor- buprenorphine and methadone are opioids. Uh, can you please explain why they are used in MAT in pregnancy and how their physiological effects are different from other opioids? Um, yes, I can. And these were the slides that I skipped over. So I, <laughs> I you know, I, I am really um, sorry about that. Do I have time to just like talk through it really kind of quickly? Sure, yeah, we, um, um, nine more minutes till 4.30, but we're happy to let um, you that, sure. Because I feel like, um, I feel like I'll just, if you, I'm just going to do this. Um, <clears throat> uh, because um, this is like one of the first um, articles written on um, opioid addictions from the 1960s. And I think it's really, it, it kind of points to a couple of things that underlie that question. So one is that they, they described, they, you know, when people first use an opioid, they might, um, I don't know if you can see the cursor movie, they might feel intoxicated, high euphoria, but rapidly over time, people no longer feel like high. They barely even feel normal. They spend most of the time, you know, in sort of in, in a withdrawal state. 
And opioids like that when with, that people become addicted to tend to overwhelmingly are short acting. So somebody with an opioid use disorder um, is um, snorting or injecting um, heroin, let's say like multiple times a day. And there's, there's this rapid cycling between uh, withdrawal, like multiple episodes of withdrawal a day. And we think that it's those multiple episodes of withdrawal that confer the risk to the fetus that you know, prematurely activates the hypothalamic pituitary access, you know, leading to a cascade of events that ends in uh, preterm delivery or low birth weight or stuff like that. So when we treat addiction, and this is from methadone, which was the first medication described for that, when dosed correctly, you can see that people don't feel sick, they don't feel high, we would say they don't experience withdrawal, they don't experience euphoria, they feel normal. And it's this stabilization that we see in, this is, would be a non-pregnant person, but it's that same principle in pregnancy. By stabilizing the pregnant person, we stabilize the uterus, we stabilize the fetus. There's, it's no longer experiencing this repeated episodes of withdrawal. Therefore, it can grow normally, oftentimes you know, delivers at term healthy birth weight. So that, I just show you that. Um, so that's sort of the, um, the, the principle, like in general, um, but in particular um, behind the use of medications to treat opioid use disorder is stabilization. I think of medications as like a platform, you know, like you stabilize the person, you stabilize the pregnant person, you stabilize the pregnancy, and that allows, that stability allows you to do other stuff. It allows for better engagement in prenatal care and the routine prenatal care screenings, allows for psychosocial like interventions and et cetera. Um, it allows, you know, that stable allows people to be, you know, screened and treated, you know, for hepatitis C or, 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 or HIV. Um, it's a platform. Uh, it's both biologically like, you know, um, um, sound, but it's also like in practice, like a platform to deliver other services. So it's not about the drug, it's about the context of the drug. In and of itself, like we, our bodies make opioids, you know, they're part, one of the oldest medications described. Um, it's not the drug, it's the context of the drug use that confers the risk. It's not the heroin per se, although it can be for overdose, certainly. And it's driven because it increasingly it's contaminated. It's an illegal substance. You have no idea what's in it. And increasingly it's contaminated with higher potency synthetic opioids. That's a dangerous combination. But it's the context of use that is um, a, what confers the risk to the fetus, not the drug itself. Hence the chemical similarity between the medication and the substance um, is, 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 not, is, is not the important distinction. And I think it's important because um, I've heard people question on um, MAT being, you know, something that some people may need um, for very long-term use, um, that they, it doesn't confer that same high that other, you know, it, like you said, stabilizes that. So they're not dipping down into the withdrawal all the time, because I, I know people question how could people parent safely if they are using, receiving MAT. Yeah, this is also some of the early literature on methadone um, um, highlighted this really kind of well. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, so when, when dosed correctly, which, you know, like that'd be true of any medication, um, you know, people don't feel sick, they don't feel euphoria, they feel normal. Um, and, 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 and I think that's really like most people want to feel normal. Um, but it's interesting that you people like stabilize on a dose of methadone that doesn't, you don't keep increasing it through treatment. Um, and, 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 and the, even though you develop tolerance, that's a, you know, physiologic principle, but the med, the, the addiction treatment part of it, like is stabilized, you know, usually at, you know, wherever it is for, 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 for whatever per, per, person. So I think the, um, and, and you wouldn't be able to tell 
like, you know, looking at somebody, talking to them, um, doing any, even like any neuropsych testing, you could not differentiate somebody who's stable on medication for opioid use disorder from somebody who's not taking medication for opioid use disorder. There's no impairment that is measurable. Um, like, like from it, just like, I mean, there's no impairment, you know, measurable from people who are stabilized on, you know, hypertensive medications or other things that affect the brain, like, you know, all, all, every psychiatric medication. 